from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming to the African Middle East Division. Uh, I'm Mary Jane Deep, Chief of the Division, and I'm delighted to see you all. We have with us, I want to recognize Chris Murphy, who was the head of the Neary section here for many, many years, and a colleague, and uh, also Michael Alban, who was a comrade in arms when we went to Iraq together and he was the head of uh, the Anglo-American acquisitions and also director of our office in Cairo. Um, I want just to say a few words uh, about our division. Our division is made up of three sections, as I think all of you know. But anyway, this is for the camera, so I always say that. Uh, the African, the Near East, and the Hebraic section uh, we collect from 78 different countries in, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Central Asia, in the Caucasus. Uh, and we collect materials primarily in this division, uh, books and serials. <clears throat> but we also have uh, CDs, DVDs, music, photographs, etc., which are in formats that we don't usually collect because there are other divisions that have them. But um, we do have our own uh, series of materials. And of course, we have man uh, manuscripts. We have um, lithographs. And I'm mentioning that in particular because this would be part of the discussion of today's uh, presenter. These materials we preserve, we keep, we share, we serve. But also, we like to have discussed. We like to have to bring scholars. We like to have people who have worked with these materials come to, the, to our reading room and talk to us about these materials, about the way they were made, where they were made, for whom they were made. Uh, it gives greater depth to our collections, and it helps us understand what we have. And it helps our patrons also get a better understanding of how these materials uh, can be used, where they are, how accessible they are, uh, sometimes how rare they are uh, as well. So we invite people to make presentations. We do displays, and very often we have displays in our reading room, and we show items uh, that we collect. We've had uh, major exhibitions, um, uh, both uh, the Persian book exhibit, we had a Hebraic book exhibit, We've had actually one on Afghanistan, and these were uh, letters that were written by Afghans um, to Radio Free Europe uh, that discussed various issues, various personal uh, problems that uh, people, uh, young people, older people face in Afghanistan. It's a unique collection of letters uh, that we have in part scanned and that will eventually be made available uh, uh, digitally uh, online. But they've already been organized, collated, uh, but still not in a fashion uh, made available. Afghanistan has been a very special focus of our, of our collections. And uh, we have acquired from um, the Afghan Media Research Center in Kabul um, over 95,000 uh, photographs. Uh, that's the largest collection ever on Afghanistan, which have been digitized, those, those photographs have been digitized in Kabul by the uh, Afghan uh, Media Research Center. They cover a period from the late 70s to 2012. We've got films, a collection of uh, films and videos from that center that are now in our um, research, in our motion picture um, collection. Uh, and we have sound recordings as well. That's in addition to the books, the serials, the journals, and, and the lithographs and manuscripts. 
I also want to recognize that Hiradi Navari, who's been in charge of our Afghan collection, has done a fantastic job in organizing and having a lot of our materials digitized and reviewed. And we have here Jan Lancaster, who herself has gone through all our uh, manuscripts, Persian manuscripts and uh, Afghan manuscripts and lithographs, and identified the problems with them. We have the preservation uh, division here uh, that has looked at our materials and um, advised us about what to do with them. So uh, collecting is just the beginning of the process by which we um, integrate the new collections into our system. And sharing with us today is Ilham Bakhtari, who has worked with these materials and who will be sharing his research and his work on these materials. And to introduce him today is our own Hirad Dinabari, a Persian specialist uh, who has done a tremendous work in uh, developing the collections and uh, preserving them. So I pass it on to Hirad. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane, for a wonderful introduction. And I want to thank you all for being here on a busy uh, lunch hour. I'm sure you would be uh, happier with food. <laughs> but I also want to take a minute and echo uh, what Mary Jane mentioned before introducing our wonderful speaker, Ilham. Uh, this has been a personal passion for me in the last few years of working with materials, uh, both manuscripts and lithograph from the region in a Persian language as well as other regional languages, especially collections from Afghanistan. Um, I'm very delighted to say we have a good amount of lithographs as well as some manuscripts and early imprints from Afghanistan that now are being digitized. I cannot mention enough how the Upstart's work with World Digital Library began the process. And we have a wonderful representative, Chris Masiangelo, here who worked with us closely as we identified over 100 Afghan titles that we digitized for that project. Um, in Pashto and in Persian, Dari Persian, that uh, are now being used. And the positive side of that is researchers like Ilham, who are now coming and are using our Afghan materials and are delighted that this material is available online. And whatever did not get, under the, uh, get done under the WDL project, in the project we're doing now, the uh, Persian, Rare Persian Language Digitization Project, we are now going to digitize in the next few years uh, from the whole region, uh, Persian materials from Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, India, and beyond. So with that, I want to take a minute and introduce Ilham. Ilham is a doctoral candidate who was awarded a Mellon Fellowship in the past year at the Library's Preservation Division to conduct research on early Afghan lithography and printing press. He made extensive use of Ahmed's rare Persian language materials, lithographic and early imprint, as well as some Pashto, and even I would say some regional publications in a Persian from all over, as well as Arabic and even Central Asian material. Um, prior to beginning his doctoral program at GW in the fall of 2012, he completed a BA in history at the University of California, Davis campus, where he focused on Middle Eastern and South Asian history. After finishing his undergraduate work, he went to complete his MA uh, in history in San Francisco State, State University, where he began to focus on Islamic intellectual thought in the British Empire. His research draws heavily on English, Persian, and Arabic sources. And um, I also want to mention that he has published um, an official uh, subaltern and Islamic modernist narratives of the first Anglo-Afghan War, the 44th Annual Conference on South Asia, uh, and this was done in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and produced by them, Center for South Asian uh, Studies uh, in Wisconsin University. Thank you, Ilham, and um, again, I look forward to working with you. I hear that Ilham will be coming back soon to do some more work at the library, and I am looking forward to working with you on closely on a better uh, understanding and appreciating our Afghan, uh, rare Afghan collections here at the library. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Mary Jane, and thank you, Harad, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I want to extend a warm thank you to the entire Library of Congress for having afforded me the opportunity uh, to do this research. Uh, this has been an incredible resource, and I've been so fortunate to be located at an institution so close by to the Library of Congress. I wouldn't have been able to do it without the Library of Congress, especially the African and Middle Eastern Division, and with the help of a wonderful staff. I've done research in England, Afghanistan, India, and I can tell you for sure that there's not as uh, helpful of a staff as, as the staff here at the African Middle Eastern Division. Uh, so thank you again, Mary Jane. Thank you to Joan Weeks, uh, and a special thank you to Arad Denavari. He really is the uh, jewel in the crown of my research, if you will. He's been with me every step of the way, and I wouldn't be able to do it without uh, the help of these people. And the Library of Congress has been especially helpful when it comes to the history of print in Afghanistan. Now, print began during the reign of Amir Sher Ali Khan. Let me pull up the uh, PowerPoint real quick. This uh, handsome individual right here, uh, he, uh, his reign was split into two parts uh, because he was engaged in a civil war with his older brothers. And he was the first one to actually bring the printing press to Afghanistan. But we don't actually have a whole lot of materials uh, that are in existence from that time period because when the British invaded Afghanistan in 1878 to dethrone him, they shelled the Bala Hissar, his fortress, where the printing house was located. And the printing house was, was burned and subsequently looted, and so we don't have uh, many materials uh, from that time period. Now, the Library of Congress has shown incredible diligence in collecting uh, materials, and so they only have a few materials from this time period, but I want you to understand that this is a huge share of the materials that exist. There aren't that many at all. And so I just want to quickly go through the ones that I analyzed. These are just the ones from the period of Amir Sher Ali Khan. There are many more materials from, the, uh, from Afghanistan, from the reigns of Amir Abdurrahman Khan, Amir Habibullah Khan, and going on forward. So these are specifically the, uh, amongst the first prints um, from uh, Afghanistan from Afghanistan. And so the first is Hajat Qawiyah that Ibtala Aqaida Wahhabiyah Qawiyah, meaning the uh, conclusive argument in validating the misleading Wahhabi creed. Uh, the next item is Shamsa Nahar, and there we have two issues here at the Library of Congress, two original issues, Shamsa Nahar meaning the morning sun, Afghanistan's uh, first newspaper. And the last one is Tufat al-Ulama, uh, which means uh, gift uh, to the ulama. Now, the first item, as the title suggests, is a polemic written targeting uh, Wahhabis. Uh, the second two I would describe as mirrors for subjects. These are materials that are instructing subjects, including the ulama, on how to behave as Muslims, what are their duties and obligations as Muslims, and what are their obligations to the ruler. And in this talk, I will suggest that although the Emir's court initially used propaganda to attack the Wahhabis, it was the Wahhabis that inspired these latter forms of propaganda in both form and substance. Now, this project was a bit difficult to undertake since there wasn't much existing scholarship on the history of print in Afghanistan. There have been some developments in recent years uh, studying the history of print in the Middle East and South Asia. Unfortunately, Afghanistan is treated like a square peg in, in the study of the Middle East and South Asia, so much of this scholarship, or almost all of this scholarship, doesn't really touch on uh, Afghanistan at all. And there have been recent developments in the study of Afghanistan in the 19th century. Uh, but most of this scholarship concerns the reign of Amir Sher Ali Khan's predecessor and father, Amir Dost Muhammad Khan, as well as his successor and cousin, uh, Amir Abdul Rahman Khan. But Amir Sher Ali Khan keeps getting skipped over. So there wasn't really a whole lot of existing scholarship uh, for me to work with. So I want to give a brief survey of the history of, of print during uh, Amir Sher Ali Khan's reign. According to colonial sources, Amir Sher Ali Khan imports a printing press in 1869, and that's a lithographic press, Chapasangi, as it's referred to in Persian. And he imported this press uh, for the purpose of printing stamps. You see in the image on the left of a 19th century lithographic press in operation, the operator is rolling the ink on to the limestone. And to the right, you see an image of a stamp from Sher Ali's Rain, and in the center is actually the image of a lion. And this was a common symbol used uh, throughout Amir Sher Ali Khan's reign, his name Sher, meaning lion. And 
that he imported the press to print stamps is telling, and that it shows that the press was not originally intended for propaganda. It's not until two years later, actually, that we have the first works of propaganda. So why did he decide to start using the press for propaganda? Well, to answer that question, we look at the first work to propaganda, both of which were religious polemics targeting the Wahhabis. Now, these are not the Wahhabis you might be thinking of, the Arabian Wahhabis founded by uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab of Najd. This is actually referring to the Tariqa Muhammadiyah, who were a militant revivalist movement founded in India um, by Syed Ahmed of Ray Bareilly and Shah, uh, Shah Ismail of Delhi. And they were a militant revivalist movement, and they were called Wahhabis because of the similarity of their ideas and actions uh, to the Arabian Wahhabis. But they actually had no organizational ties. The actual forerunner to the movement was a contemporary of Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab. They were actually born in the same year. And his name was Shah Wali Allah of Delhi. And Shah Wali Allah of Delhi, we could describe more or less as a Salafi, meaning someone who believed that the society of the Prophet Muhammad and the Rashidun Caliphate were a model for contemporary Muslims and that contemporary Muslims could and should emulate that society. And they would do that by purging themselves of innovations that had cropped into the religion since that time period. And some of these uh, innovations, the ones that he went after the most, were what he referred to as pseudo-Sufi practices in society at large. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a little high. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so some of the practices that he went after, uh, he referred to as pseudo-Sufi practices. Uh, that were common throughout British India. And these practices revolved around Sufi saints, both uh, past and present. And these included acts like asking saints for intercession between them and God, shrine-oriented worship, the wearing of talismans and charms. And Shah Wali Allah believed that these practices were, were very prevalent because Muslims actually didn't know the Quran. Very few Muslims actually uh, were able to read the Quran because of it being in Arabic. And he believed that if they knew the Quran, they wouldn't be doing these practices. If they, if they actually knew what the contents of the Quran were, uh, they would immediately stop uh, all these kind of shrine-oriented activities and, and what have you. Now, the issue was, in India and in most of the Islamic world, it was taboo to translate the Quran. The consensus was that you could not translate the Quran without distorting the meaning. But Shah Wali Allah, being very confident in his skills in Arabic and Persian, decided to translate the Quran from Arabic to Persian. And this was really the first uh, translation of the Quran in South Asia. And he translated this Quran specifically for Mughal court officials and elite military officers. And my theory is that he did this specifically for them because they were the decision makers in India. And he believed that the decline of Muslim political power in India had to do with this improper practice of Islam. He believed that if he could get the decision makers of India to practice Islam correctly, if they could understand uh, what Islam, the true message of Islam was, then they could potentially administrate the country better and right the ship, if you will. The Tariq of Muhammadiyah take this message, but they want to expand it beyond the court. They want to take it to the streets, if you will. And they believe that for society to change, everyone needed to be involved. It couldn't just be something that was top down. It really had to be bottom up uh, to a certain extent. And scholars theorize that they believe that this was possible because of the printing press, okay? That the printing press inspired them that Shah Wali Allah's reformation could be expanded to society at large. And so they used relative, uh, print relatively early in their movement. Starting in 1824, they established a printing press in Calcutta. Subsequently, they established presses in Delhi, Lucknow, Lahore, and other cities. And they write pamphlets that almost anyone could understand. If they couldn't read them, at, if they were read to them, at least they would be able to understand the language. And they used a simplified form of Persian in their initial pamphlets. Now, when Shah Wali Allah wrote, he wrote in Arabic and Persian, and he wrote in a very sophisticated form of Arabic and Persian. So even if it was read to you, you might not actually understand what he was talking about. But they uh, wrote with the masses in mind. And eventually, they started writing in Urdu, which was a spoken language among some Indian Muslims. So it was not just simply an acquired language like Persian was. This is an image of a 
Tariqa publication. This is uh, a work by Shah Abdul Aziz, who was actually not a member of the Tariqa. He was the son of Shah Waliullah, and he was revered by the Tariqa, and so they made efforts to publish his work. This one, Bustan al muhaddisin And most of their lithographs look like this, and you kind of see the variety of scripts being used, Nastalik and Salus here, and so this kind of gives you the idea of what they look like, but most of their publications, especially their initial publications, uh, were works that were dedicated to attacking the pseudo-Sufism that Shah Waliullah spoke of, and the most important work in the initial period is a work called Taqwiyat Aliman, The Strengthening of Faith, by Shah Ismail. So in this book, he goes after these rituals that he considers innovations, bidda, in Islam, but he also challenges traditional theological positions. And what he does is he accuses scholars, past and present, of having put limits on God's power. He says that they mistake the impossibility of God doing something for being the inability of God to do something. He gives the case, for example, that although God would not create another prophet, Muhammad being the final prophet, God still has the ability to create another prophet, even another Muhammad. Thousands of Muhammads, if he wills. This sets off a firestorm of debate in India. Uh, some of the established uh, ulama like, flip their lid over this. And this debate rages on for three decades and even continues to this day, really. I mean, you can go on forums today and people are still having these kinds of arguments. But really, from the 1830s to the 1860s, all kinds of works, massive volumes are being written about this subject. Now, Kabul, Afghanistan wasn't really involved in these debates, but that didn't mean that they weren't aware of these individuals. Amir Sher Ali Khan's father actually on two occasions had military alliances with the Tariqa Muhammadiyah. So the Tariqa Muhammadiyah actually established a militant wing in the frontier between the Punjab and Afghanistan. And the reason they did this is because in, in the early 19th century, the Sikhs had taken over the city of Peshawar and they had banned Muslims there from consuming beef and performing the azan, the public call to prayer. And the Tariqa had said that these were grounds for a jihad. And therefore they went there and they set up a base to fight the Sikhs. And the Afghans were interested in fighting the Sikhs because they had lost Peshawar to the Sikhs. And so uh, they found common ground and they allied, but it doesn't seem like they really had any theological discussions in, 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 in all this uh, chaos, uh, jihad being the priority. The effort fails. Said Ahmad and Shah Ismail are both killed in 1831, and the Afghans give up on their attempt to take back Peshawar. However, in 1839, when the British invaded Afghanistan to dethrone Amir Dost Muhammad Khan, again, they strike up another brief alliance. Hundreds of Tariqa members go to the city of Ghazni to help put up a stand with the locals there, and that fails as well. And according to reports, they all return back to the frontier. So none of them remain in Afghanistan. And Kabul doesn't really hear about them much until 1871. And according to, to those sources, they state that in that year or some time before, some Punjabi and Peshawari ulama had forwarded a request for, to the Kabul court for a refutation of the Tariqa's beliefs and the Tariqa's doctrine. This brings up the question, why would they send this to the Kabul court? There had already been volumes of works refuting these individuals' ideas, authored by well-respected scholars, scholars that were more eminent than in, anyone in Kabul, including Maulana Khairabadi. My theory is that Traditionally, if you read the works in Islamic scholasticism by authors like Imam Ghazali or Fakhreddin Arazi, they make it very clear that it's the prerogative of the Islamic ruler to deal with heretics. It's the Islamic ruler that has to commission uh, the ulama to write heresiographies. It's the job of the ulama to administer the punishment, whether that be humiliating them, imprisoning them, or executing them. And the problem for the Punjabi ulama is that the British rule India. And they thus cannot give those refutations the official stamp of approval that was traditionally required. Amir Sher Ali Khan was the nearest independent Muslim ruler to the Punjab, and it helped that he had a printing press as well. Therefore, he was the natural choice to commission these works. And so two refutations were issued from the Kabul court uh, in the same year, 1871. And so 
the work on the left is Hujat al Kawiyah that Ibn al Aqwaid of Wahhabi al Kawiyah, the one I mentioned earlier. This one was a, a, a scholarly work. It was authored by Maulana Abdul Rahman, who was the chief Qazi uh, during the reign of Amir Sher Ali Khan. And it's in Persian and Arabic. It uses a lot of classic text, scholarly sources, a lot of logic. The source on the right is Shahab de Salkhib, The Piercing Flame. This one was actually authored by the Emir himself, and it was, des it was not scholarly at all. And the Emir explains in the tract as to why. Uh, he states, in this tract, I have not entered into the discussion of many Islamic sciences. I believe the ulama in every country have already crafted responses to this kufr, this disbelief. But because those writings include scientific terminology, the masses cannot understand them. Hence, it is not the ulama that are falling into the claws of these owls, rather the hunt of these enslavers is after the mice who are ignorant. This is a teeth-shattering response to the infidels that no one has yet to give, which will render the infidels without the strength and ability to speak. And what's interesting about that work is how much it mirrors Tariqa literature. The Tariqa, they would focus on the Quran and Hadith. They wouldn't really use the other materials, the auxiliary materials for understanding Quran, you know, these tafsir and, and so forth. They would try to make it all about the Quran and, and Hadith. And if you look at the difference in, in, in materials that are used in Hujat al Qawiyah versus Shahab al Saqib, the ones I have listed here for Hujat are just a fraction. There are actually many more sources that are used. But in Shahab al Saqib, there are only two sources used. And they're not even really cited. They're just kind of mentioned. Like, I'm not a crazy man making all this up. If, if you want to read further, you can find these ideas in the Tasfir, Nishapudi, and al Baizawi. So otherwise, the text is really very similar to the kinds of literature that are produced by the Tariqa, such as Taqwiyat Aleman. It's written for society at large, and it's written in an accessible language. And the Emir uh, informs the reader that he did this intentionally. For the honor of the strong Mohammedan religion, I've decided to present in some plain words, in simple, fluent Persian, the beliefs and opinions held by these unfortunate people. And so he was essentially uh, combating Tariqa propaganda with the same, with the similar structure, if you will, fighting fire with fire. Now, interestingly, after these polemics, the Emir decides to produce more propaganda, not to go after the Tariqa. He actually never mentions them ever again in the remaining publications. Who he does go after is Afghanistan's own ulama. And I suggest that although uh, both of these texts went after the Tariqa viciously, the Emir learned from the Tariqa just how effective print propaganda could be in changing the minds of society and challenging recalcitrant ulama. The Tariqa had really shaken the authority of the traditional ulama in India. They had drawn tens of thousands uh, of, of followers, including seminary students away from eminent ulama. Some prominent scholars even became members. As a result, some, member, some major mosques were reoriented towards Tariqa doctrine. Uh, the Tariqa also inspired the non-militant Diobandi and Ahl Hadith movements, which today are major schools of thought in India, at, throughout South Asia, and including Afghanistan as well. Now, why was the Emir interested in challenging the ulama? Historically, the ulama in Afghanistan were central to the legitimacy of the shahs and emirs, also in instrumental in conscripting volunteers to support them in civil wars or foreign invasions. Now, the Mir really needed their help because he was trying to centralize the government, primarily through a central modern army. And the problem was that a lot of ulama were financially independent of the Mir. They really didn't need his support, and in turn, they really didn't have any need to give him support for this project. They had other sources of patronage, tribal chieftains, local rulers, even the Mir's brothers, who were rival claimants to the throne. And these reforms threatened to disenfranchise the ulama's patrons of their traditional military authority and revenue. Historically, these chieftains and rulers provided military levies to the shahs and emirs in exchange for revenue and autonomy, but the emir was looking to circumvent them and reduce them to pensionaries. And so the ulama, almost like representatives, articulated opposition to the emir's reforms, but rather than cry disenfranchisement, they made a religious argument that the emir's reforms were actually innovations, bidda, with no precedent, with no precedent in Islam. Therefore, the emir was 
in need of a way to respond to that argument. And after the Wahhabi debates, he begins printing materials that targeted that opposition. So we look at some of the latter forms of propaganda, and this is the cover from an issue of Shamsa Nahar, The Morning Sun. Shamsa Nahar uh, was Afghanistan's first newspaper, but it was more really like a gazette. Uh, the earliest issue we have in existence is from uh, November 6, 1873. That's number five. This here is number seven, uh, which is housed here at the Library of Congress. And this newspaper only has a run of about three years. And my theory is that it, it was founded on the Amir's intelligence network. The newspaper talks about, for example, having foreign correspondence, but these correspondents were actually in the same locations the Amir would send envoys and diplomats to. And so I feel like these were, these were likely the same people that were sending the reports back to the Amir on the ongoings in Bukhara, Samarkand, and Khokhan. And then once the Amir was done looking at these reports, he would then uh, forward them to the office of Shams and Nahar. Um, of course, edited for any sensitive information. Now, when it came to news around the world, the Amir didn't have agents beyond the neighboring countries of Afghanistan. But what he relied on were foreign newspapers, especially British Indian newspapers. And I've provided here a table of some of the newspapers that were used. There were many more that were cited in Shams and Nahar. But you can see that these newspapers come from many different parts of India, Karachi, Lahore, Bombay, Calcutta. You get a pretty good spread there in different languages, Persian, English, and Urdu. And also, uh, there were a few newspapers that had come from London itself, including the Illustrated London News. And Shams and Nahar had a staff to translate these materials. Uh, there were a few people there that were educated in English. They had mostly been brought over from British India to work specifically in this respect. And so, although these, although Shams and Nahar would reprint these stories, and they were clearly not original stories in Shams and Nahar, the selection of them is quite interesting. There was news from all over the world. For example, they would talk about some of the wars that were going on in Europe such as the Carlos Wars in Spain. They would also talk a lot about imperialism going on in the rest of the world, Dutch imperialism in East Asia, British imperialism in West Africa. And so it really pushed the idea that imperialism was uh, a problem throughout the world and that Afghanistan, uh, likewise, was under threat, both by the Russians and eventually by the British as well. There are also articles on science and articles for general knowledge. There's an article about the Pacific Ocean, just explaining what the Pacific Ocean is, how big it is, what are some of its features. Uh, but most importantly, there were a number of think pieces in Shams and Nahar, and these were reflections on the news items, or they were printed speeches of the Emir or his chief secretary, Qazi Abdul Qadir Khan, or they might have been, even been original articles. But all of them had the common theme of enjoining the Emir's subjects to take the example of other countries and pursue knowledge and show dedication and loyalty to the Emir. And many of these think pieces also contained criticism of the country's ulama and responding to the opposition of the country's ulama. Uh, there was even a book published in 1875 specifically for this task, this book being called Tufat al-Ulama, Gift to the Ulama. You can see it's in pretty rough condition. These lithographs have been through wars, um, going back to the second Anglo-Afghan war and up to the present uh, war today in Afghanistan. So I know they look rough, but just <laughs> try to understand that they, they, they've seen a lot of, uh, of destruction. And this work, um, it opposes the ulama in a similar way to how the Taraka opposed uh, the ulama of India. And my dissertation will look at the ways both Shamsa Nahar and Tufat al ulama used the discursive methods of Taraka literature. Um, but for now, I just want to discuss, uh, for the time remaining, I want to discuss the staff that was involved in the production of these lithographs. And we don't have a lot of info about them. The British weren't very interested in the press in Afghanistan, at least not until they started producing materials talking about jihad. Once they start producing materials about jihad, then they start paying a little closer attention. But we don't really have much knowledge about the staff that actually operated the press and was responsible for creating these materials. All we know is what we can gather from these materials themselves. 
And it's very interesting is that we see a very clear Shia and Iranian element in the production of these lithographs. Uh, for example, the two works against the Wahhabis, Hujat, Hujat al-Khawiyya and Shahab al-Saqib, uh, were produced by a man named Mirza Muhammad Sadiq Tabrizi. Now, that he was from Tabriz is not a surprise because Tab Tabriz was the first site of printing in Iran, both for typography and lithography. And Tabrizis would go to other parts of the Islamic world, establish presses and newspapers. Uh, the newspaper Akhtar in Istanbul, for example, was founded by Tabrizi. Um, and there was a Tabrizi diaspora throughout the Ottoman Empire, also in parts of India. So the fact that Mirza Muhammad Sadiq was from Tabriz and, and probably helped found uh, the printing press in Afghanistan and operated. It shouldn't be that surprising. There was another Iranian associated with the production of, of this work to Fatah al ulama uh, Mirza, uh, Mirza Bayza Khan Shirazi. And Shiraz also had uh, printing established there long before Afghanistan. So it, it probably appears that the Amir sought out people that could help run the press. Since Afghanistan had not had a press before his reign, there was no one there really adequately trained to operate it, and so he needed to import labor that was familiar with that. With Shams and Nahar, interestingly, though, the name that is associated with it as the director and editor is Mirza Abdul Ali. And he does not have a nisbah. He is not identified with a city in Iran. And so my guess is that he was a uh, Kizilbash, uh, of the Kizilbash, Shia Kizilbash community in Afghanistan who had a long history in that area since the time of Nadir Shah Afshurid as mercenaries and then later as Mirza's secretaries and clerks. And he was put in charge uh, specifically of Shamsa Nahar and uh, its content and editing it. I'm not sure if he was actually involved in the process of producing Shamsa Nahar, but it's possible that he learned it from Mirza Muhammad Sadiq Tabrizi or Mirza Baiza Khan Shirazi. Now, it's interesting how these Shia individuals are helping the production of works that are challenging the Taraka and the ulama. And it appears that their religious beliefs might have risked discrediting the authority of the materials produced. And what was interesting as I was going through them, I noticed that in the colophon of Shihab al-Saqib, the one authored by Amir Sher Ali Khan, you read, Wasa'i Mirza Muhammad Sadiq Tabrizi, uh, by the effort of Mirza Muhammad Sadiq Tabrizi. However, in the colophon for Hujat al we see Wasa'i Mirza Muhammad Sadiq. The Tabrizi was left out, interestingly. And the author of Hujat al was an established alim in Afghanistan, a traditional alim. Uh, Maulana Abdurrahman Khan. His father had actually written heresiographies against the Shias of Iran during the uh, Qajar Sadozai battles over Herat in the early 19th century. And so it seems that he actually requested that the Tabrizi uh, be left out because it would be a, give de a dead giveaway that Ishi was involved in the production of this work. And that would highly discredit uh, its authority, almost. However, the emir left it in. And it kind of shows you the difference in mentalities between the emir and a traditional alim in Afghanistan. And the, and the style, yeah. Very different, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Nazca, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So I hope this gave you some understanding of the origins of print of Afghanistan, and I look forward to any questions you might have. I have one more question. Uh, a lot of what you were examining mm -hmm. is deeper, prints, binding, mm -hmm. things of that sort. And I know that you didn't have enough time to focus on that. But just to give an overview, what did you, what did you find from looking at all these Afghan and other uh, regional lithographs? Can you keep the print for the... Okay, okay. Uh, so Harad is referencing my research that I did this past year working with the Preservation Research Testing Division of the Library of Congress, and we we're trying to establish the provenance of the printing press itself and of the papers used. And originally I was intrigued by this topic because of these Iranian uh, staff members of the printing press, because Iran 
really learned the printing press from Russia. People were, had been sent there to learn the printing press. They had imported the printing press from Russia, and they also would import materials from Russia. So I was curious if, where were the materials coming from? Were they coming more from British India? Were they coming from Russia? Possibly Iran as well, because Iran started producing its own paper in this time period as well. What we discovered is that more or less the materials did come from British India. And we had a chance to look at a number of watermarks that were in some of these, especially Hujat e Khawiya and Shams and Nahar. Uh, they had wonderful watermarks, and all of them came from mills in London. And we believe that this paper had been sent to British India and then purchased uh, from British India. And this is a good indication that the printing press itself also came from British India. It was definitely transported to Afghanistan through British India, and it was, probably, it was likely uh, created in British India as well. Thank you very much for a very rich peek at a very deep subject. Right, right. A couple of questions. What, what about question uh, publications, or the question publications? Were the publications sold? Uh, how were they distributed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in regards to Pashto, yes, in this period of time, uh, the first materials of Pashto are being printed as well, but these were mostly military manuals that were translated from English. The emir wanted Pashto to be the official language of the military, which is ironic because all the other publications are in Persian. So this, you can kind of see some of the contradictions that are already starting to emerge in the ideology of the Afghan state. And so you have one, you have Persian as sort of the language of culture, the language of politics and diplomacy, but on the other hand, you're trying to make Pashto the language of the military. And there are actually exams being given in Pashto as well. So, and a lot of the generals and officers in the military were actually Kizilbash who were not really Pashto speakers. And so you can kind of, imagine what kind of tensions these might have created. Unfortunately, we don't have any of these manuals, these, these, these military manuals that are in Pashto, but under Amir Abdul Rahman Khan, uh, similar manuals were produced and those are available. The British Library has some of those and I had a chance to look at some of them. Uh, but otherwise, they're, they're really just straight translations of, of the British Indian uh, manuals. And as far as the sales of, of, of these materials. I would say that the polemics were distributed uh, throughout Afghanistan to provincial rulers to be read in public, either in the bazaars or in the masjids, in the mosques. As for Shamsa Nahar, it was available for purchase. Actually, info about how to subscribe was in every issue. Based on what I understand about subsequent newspapers in Afghanistan, and other newspapers in the region, such as Iran, usually these newspapers would be forced upon people in the government, and they would be automatically docked from their pay. Uh, <laughs> so th there was that. But also in Shams and Har, it does mention that you could, anyone could kind of go to a, a, a seller of hundis in Kabul, a, a, a uh, Chilaram Shikarpuri, and they could purchase a hundi and they would get a subscription of Shams and Har uh, every week or every month. Actually, it was never printed regularly, but the idea was that it was going to be printed every week, at least initially, and that they could sign up and they could get it. It's not clear if that shop that gave the hundis also had individual issues. It does list the price of an individual issue, but we don't really have much indication uh, as to whether this was something that would be sold on the streets, like a modern newspaper. Uh, there was also the possibility of purchasing the newspaper from British India, so it gives you instructions on how to purchase it if you're in Peshawar, but it's not really clear how far it was distributed into India. You could purchase it from Peshawar, but we don't really have any idea of how far or widely it was distributed. So we, we, could, we would limit the readership to the area of Afghanistan and the immediate area in, in British India.
Not yet. No, not yet. Not the ones in Afghanistan. The Tariqa had the capability. And it's interesting that they don't respond to these polemics, at least not that I know of. And I think that part of the reason is because he was the lone independent Islamic ruler in the area, this would open up another can of worms if they tried to challenge him openly about his ideas, because he really is the authority on what is orthodoxy. So, um, but they do not challenge him. Uh, and it's not until much later that you have private presses in Afghanistan, well into the 20th century. One more thing that came up yeah. in our work that you were doing hmm. is it was curious that a lot of classics of Persian literature, Rumi, uh, Hafiz, uh, Omar Khayyam, Sadish, etc., we tend to find most of them are from India mainly, and then partially Iran and Central Asia. With the Afghan material, it seemed that there was an attempt to make it unique, the content and subject uniquely Afghan. Could you say a few words as far as what your theory is, why these classics, which were obviously used in Afghanistan and loved in Afghanistan, yeah. were not being produced and published? Right, yeah, so this is going to be a big part of my dissertation research, and most of those ideas are still in beta mode, uh, but I will speak to that a little bit. So in Qajar, Iran, for example, you do have uh, reproductions of these epic works of poets like Hafiz, Shirazi, you have the Shah Nama being produced. You don't have that in Afghanistan. And my theory is that the Emir Sher Ali Khan, when he talks about the history of Afghanistan, he characterizes it as a terra nullius of savagery, that Afghanistan was basically an unknown land until he had come to power. Afghans were ignorant, Afghans lived in darkness, and I believe that he did not want to print these great works because it would remind people of Khorasani civilization. It would remind people of a time that indeed there was civilization in Afghanistan and it was certainly better than anything the emir was building. Uh, the emir wanted to portray the past as simply one of darkness because it would sharpen the contrast of his own rule. And I believe that unlike the Qajars who were trying to associate their rule with earlier uh, Iranian dynasties like the Safavids, Amir Sher Ali Khan did not want any association with any uh, previous rulers, both in Afghanistan uh, and Islam. Like the Tariqa, he actually really tries to associate his rule most closely with the Salaf, with the, with the, with the Prophet Muhammad and the Rashidun Caliphate. That's really the, the history that he tries to attach his rule, and that's, how, and that's one of the connections I'm going to be trying to draw between the Tariqa and Amir Sher Ali Khan. Uh, sure. Do we have a full list of the publications that came out of uh, the Shah Ali Khan's press? So there's a lot of speculation about certain works that were produced but have been destroyed. So there are lists, I have a list of works that do exist. Uh, Robert McChesney uh, at NYU had, has compiled a list of, of works that, that were produced from the time of Amir Shah Ali Khan. But there are also other works that we don't have any extant copies of them, uh, but people speculate, uh, especially Afghan scholars speculate them uh, to have been uh, produced. Um, and I have, I, have, I have some information on, on that material. If you're interested, I could share it with you. Amir Sher Ali Khan is trying to really just create a central authority in Afghanistan. So the Afghan kingdom was really founded on a series of partnerships with other chieftains in uh, the Durrani tribe. And so there was real no, there was not really any central kind of leadership throughout the country. There was much autonomy. Uh, divided between uh, the different tribes and also between the different brothers, even in, in the royal family. 
And he's trying to centralize the entire country. He's trying to do this primarily through an army. And in Shams al Nahar, he tries to dress this up as creating civilization, as educating people. But when you really look at it, the civilization that he's talking about, the education that he's talking about, the production in arts and, and, and crafts, it all has to do with the military. When he talks about education, for example, and cr creating scholars out of Afghans, he's just talking about sending them to these military schools that he's established and having them learn military formations and drills along the British Indian model. When he talks about arts and crafts, right, bring, bringing manufacturing, he's just talking about the factories that he's established to produce weapons. Okay? So even though he's trying to dress it up as civilization, what he's really just talking about is this, this military that he's, that he's trying to create to consolidate his authority over the entirety of Afghanistan. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Ilham, for a wonderful presentation. And the work continues uh, as we digitize the material becomes available online um, on various platforms and hopefully the library soon. Uh, people from around the world can chime in and use this material. And Ilham, we look forward to having you come and work more with our Afghan materials that are now being processed as we speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.